On today's World Insights, Trump versus Biden, round one, the clash of the U.S. presidential titans, showdown over the economy, the pandemic, the Supreme Court, and foreign policy. Who will come out on top? Polls and surveys, about half of the country say that they've really found a financial hit. Just look at the registration figures. Uh, if the Democrats can turn out their flock, they will defeat the Republicans. Here is our host, Tian Wei. Hello and welcome to World Inside. I'm Tian Wei in Beijing. The closely contested U.S. presidential campaign gets fiercer this week when Donald Trump and Joe Biden go head to head in a presidential debate. With five weeks to go until November the 3rd, when most voters go to the polls, the stakes are high. On Sunday, Trump was reported to have paid little or no income tax for years before and after he came to power. And with his history of skillful showmanship and brutal debate tactics, Trump is hoping the Cleveland showdown with Biden will put him back on top. But he needs to answer Biden's questions likely on the more than 200,000 COVID-19 deaths in the U.S., the long-lasting economic fallout and widespread fatigue at the constant upheaval roiling his administration. With an ultra-polarized climate and many voters still undecided to vote or not, analysts say it's unclear how much debates can actually move the needle. How to make heads or tales of all these uncertainties. Let's loop in our panelists, all from the United States. For more on the U.S. election and the upcoming debate, uh, in Charlotte, North Carolina, we are joined by Mary Curtis, a columnist and roll call senior leader of the Op Ed Project. Good to see you after many months. Uh, and Thank in Washington, D.C., we have uh, Bruce Fain, the former Associate Deputy Attorney General and General Counsel of the Federal Communications Commission under President Reagan. Good to see you, sir. In Washington, D.C., Brandon Andrews, an entrepreneur and former Capitol Hill staffer. Good to see you, Brandon. In Washington, D.C., once again, Rick Dunham, Director of Global Business Journalism Program, veteran political journalist. I'm looking forward to seeing you in Beijing, hopefully. Let me start by asking all of you, the reason we have an all-American panel is because it is an election of yours rather than anybody else. But the impact of that election will be felt probably by everybody else in the world. So, uh, Ms. Curtis, uh, what do you think are some of the most deciding factors in this election? I think one of the biggest issues, of course, is the coronavirus. And in America, we've passed more than 200,000 dead, and we see spikes in part of the country. Uh, and so that, of course, is a huge issue. Are we prepared? Uh, we also see the resulting economic issues because of it, the economic turmoil. And there's some bits of recovery, but there's huge swaths of the American public that have, are having problems and have really felt in uh, recent polls and surveys about half of the country say that they've really found a financial hit. And also, we do see continuing uh, racial reckoning. We've seen protests uh, throughout the country on the issue of systemic racism, uh, police violence, other issues. And so we've seen some marches for racial equity. And issues that come out from those as well, like the health crisis with coronavirus, mm. has illuminated inequalities in our country when it comes to health care and education and the job market. I think if we're asking about the world, the projection of the United States globally will persist, uh, specifically with regard to China, despite what Mr. Trump's rhetoric has been, uh, despite his claim that he's trying to recede from Europe, he's expanded NATO, adding two more countries, North Macedonia and Montenegro, uh, built up forces there. He's going to move some troops around Germany, but still remain in Europe. And I think it's tragic, but we haven't faced up to the fact in the United States 
that between the two candidates, there really very little difference with regard to our projection, 800 military bases abroad, involvement in nine wars, spending over a trillion dollars on national security, committing war crimes, disdaining the International Criminal Tribunal, and basically trying to walk it alone. And I think that's a very uh, troubling situation for all the world, because that's not going to change no matter who wins on November 3rd. Okay. Mr. Duncan, is the picture quite pessimistic as uh, Mr. Feng just described? But I think this election is boiling down to a question of whether American citizens, American voters, can stomach the idea, can stand the idea of having Donald Trump as their president for four more years. So the first question is, do we want to, in the words of his old TV show, fire him? And number two, are we willing to hire Joe Biden to replace him? And we know them both very well. We know uh, Donald Trump from TV and from governing the country. We know Joe Biden for nearly, from. Uh, for 48 years in public office, and so I think those are the questions that will decide that will decide who wins on November 3rd. We try to divide uh, the issues uh, during our discussion today. So let's focus on first of all the economy. Means, of course, uh, Mr. Andrews are very passionate about. Uh, uh, but what do you think? It's it's already just less uh, about a month to go uh, before the election. Will new measures uh, really make a difference uh, to people's lives, or is really the rhetoric coming from the two candidates about the economy that's going to count? Well, I think if there's another relief package that comes from Congress, something that Americans have been waiting on for months now, again, it was the, the it was summertime uh, the, the, when the last relief package was passed. I think if that happens uh, and one side or the other is able to uh, get a big win or claim a victory in the eyes of the public, that could move some people. Uh, but largely, folks have, have already made up their minds. Um, I, I think the, the economy and, and the impact on your wallet mm. is something that does have an opportunity to move, to move some votes um, because it directly impacts people day to day. Um, but we'll see what comes out of the negotiations between Nancy Pelosi uh, and the uh, Trump administration, Steve Mnuchin, right. this week. I think for the country that, that something comes out of it, but, but we'll just have to see. Well, as a historian by training, uh, I, I, am, I recall that uh, no president has won re-election with an unemployment rate this high since Franklin Roosevelt. So uh, history would tell us that an incumbent president is in deep trouble uh, when this many people are displaced, when this many people are jobless. On the other hand, Donald Trump trails Joe Biden not only in the overall polls, but on almost every issue. But one issue that he has been persistently ahead in is handling the economy. Uh, he still has an advantage with most voters. And in swing states, in states like Pennsylvania, Michigan, Florida, the advantage seems even a little larger in the polling mm -hmm. on the economy. So his job is to convince people who are uneasy about the economy that they have a better chance of doing well if he is reelected that if they take a chance on Joe Biden. For Joe Biden, uh, the job is to convince American people that he understands their problems and that he actually would do things for average people, for working people, and not just rich people and corporations. Mm -hmm. Interestingly, the tax return report uh, uh, provided by the New York Times uh, came out uh, right before the first uh, debate. And of course, uh, it attracts so much eyeball, Mr. Fain. As a result, uh, will there be a October surprise? Will this count as an October surprise? How much impact will it have on voters' mentality at all? The New York Times came out with the front page stories, more voluminous than previously. But I don't think that the revelations, although they're more documented, really surprised anybody. It certainly didn't surprise me. Uh, we know his character from background, cutting corners with taxes. Uh, trying to cheat out his siblings of inheritances and whatever. Uh, so I don't believe that that is going to be decisive in removing a block of voters from his base. I would point out that one of the reasons why I think he's retained some popularity among those who think he does well with the economy is that he 
in violation of the Hatch Act when the first stimulus bill over three trillion dollars was passed he had his name for the first time in history placed on the Treasury checks that went to all the recipients and he also because I saw them and wrote about them he also had on White House stationery letters that he wrote to every direct depository beneficiary of the uh, the COVID-19 uh, stimulus package stating in effect that uh -huh. he is the one who's responsible for their money not the Congress of the United States now that's quite a, a god of a free probably multi-million dollar advertising so many of the voters believe that the stimulus package whatever it comes from is really a gift of Donald Trump not the Congress well I think that um the votes are pretty baked in as far as this report from the New York Times came in. I do think that there are pieces of it that rub people the wrong way, that $750 that he paid in taxes, when so many people who are working class and middle class pay so much more. And also it showed that his whole persona, which was, I am the great businessman, and it turned out he played a businessman on TV when he really wasn't that great a businessman. Mm, interesting point. Uh, Mr. Andrews, you're a business person. Is he a good bi businessman? Uh, <laughs> no, go ahead uh, about that point, the tax return. Well, he, he had a great head start. His, his family had some significant business success, uh, and he was able to, uh, he was able to turn that success into some a success for himself. Now, I, I do absolutely believe that the portrait that he's painted of himself, whether it was on TV or through his book deals, um, etc., in the media, um, certainly doesn't match the reality, and we see that from the tax returns. Um, however, he was able to do something, but he had a head start, and I think that is one of the primary issues as we go through this election cycle and go into 2021. Mm -hmm. um, who can Sure that there is a level playing field that every American that the environment of America is an environment in which everyone can reach their full potential right. um, economically socially and otherwise uh, versus uh, white Americans having having a head start which of course they've had for uh, for generations in this country mm -hmm. to me our conversation is extremely informing and extremely interesting because we've seen a, a debate that sometimes will be dragged always to the direction whether Donald Trump will be the most uh, a suitable person vis-a-vis -vis the real issues, uh, the issues that you all consider as very crucial for the United States as a country. Uh, so, uh, Mr. Dunham, does it fall into your earlier statement about this is about uh, Donald Trump or not? Yeah, I do think so, uh, but I. Some of that is that Do Donald Trump, uh, we project our feelings, what we care about most on him and, and the issues that we care about, we look at his positions on it. If, if we are against abortion, then we look at that. And if we care about the Supreme Court, Republicans controlling the Supreme Court uh, for 30 years, uh, one way or the other, we do that. Uh, and, and then the same way with health care, uh, if we want to protect or expand the Obamacare, mm -hmm. uh, then you look at Trump and what he has tried to do. So I, I, I mean, I do think there, there, are, there are significant differences on issues, but a lot of it we see through the lens of what Donald Trump is saying. Even well, even and especially COVID-19 and the coronavirus. Uh, I mean, from wearing politicizing wearing masks and uh, politicizing science. Uh, to uh, to the issue of, of uh, even is the death count accurate? Uh, his, the the uh, Trump world is saying this more than 200,000 people have not died, and there are all sorts of conspiracy right. theories there. So almost, almost everything in the political world is is divided into the Trump world and the non-Trump world. The United States presidential election. CGTN brings context, perspective, and understanding. Watch CGTN. See the difference. Well, one of the things people are really looking at um, uh, about what's going on is, uh, you know, the debate uh, inside your country about law and order, 
which has been a slogan put forward by President Trump, vis-à-vis uh, -vis, uh, the racial equity, if I could uh, use this word. Uh, Ms. Curtis, I know you've been writing extensively about the subject over the past few months. Uh, tell me about your feeling, whether this will be the issue, whether African-American voters will really matter in this election, and uh, is this really about issues or is it really about political slogans? Well, it's about, as um, Mr. Andrews talked about, um, 400 years since the founding of this country, there have been inequities. And I think pretty much, even though law and order is used to be divisive, everyone can agree that they would like law and order, but they want everyone to be subject to it. So they want police to be accountable for how they police. And so many uh, communities, including the one I grew up in, you had over-policing and under-protection. And they want it all to be equal. Now, Trump, the president, has tried to say it is a lawlessness. But most of the demonstrations have been peaceful. There have been some who have taken advantage. And sometimes you have white provocateurs, like the Boogaloo Boys, um, who have brought in violence. Uh, and I do think that Trump has been divisive in that he has defended like the some white vigilantes, including a young man who shot three and is accused of homicide and killing two demonstrators. And he has seemed to defend them. So uh, I do have a fear that with uh, Donald Trump talking about he won't accept the results of the election and if he doesn't win, it's rigged. Now, you can say that's some trolling or game playing, but some of his hardcore supporters, mm -hmm. many of whom are armed, have talked about that. There has been concerns whether this election will further divide the United States, particularly about the racial issues and about justice issues. Uh, Mr. Fain. The racial equity issue has been around for a long time. It is not novel in 2020. It continues to persist. It goes back to the civil rights days that I was involved in the 1960s. Um, I don't believe that the, the current uh, racial division is a, you know, a, a, a new uh, quantum level above what w has been experienced, uh, quite unfortunately, uh, for years and years and years. Uh, and it will produce some uh, turnout. Uh, and I do think Trump has exacerbated the problem because of his white supremacist language. Uh, but again, I go back as an American and as a country going forward. The most important thing about the law is we have a peaceful transition okay. after the election. Well, no, I was not in, in agreement. Uh, you, it, I, I have three older siblings who were involved in the civil rights movement, and it goes further beyond that. And I would just reiterate, yes, law and order means that the White House, from the White House on down, that they also would be following the laws of the country, the Constitution, peaceful transfer of power, and also all the uh, egregious conflicts of interest that we have seen. Uh, and, uh, but I do feel that there are more people speaking out, but you have seen in the demonstration, not just minorities, but all kinds of people who want to learn and can see through these videos and things that, yes, there is injustice and we need to do something about it as mm. Americans. Mm. Mr. Andrews. This issue is more prominent this, this campaign cycle than we've seen certainly in my lifetime and perhaps um, than we've seen in the lifetimes of, of any American that's living right now. Uh -huh. So, yes, it is a significant issue. Yes, the two candidates have to address it directly. I'm sure Chris Wallace will ask direct questions about it tomorrow. Yes. And um, Americans will be looking for um, a president uh, with whoever wins on November 3rd um, to address these issues moving forward and, and, again, create an environment in which everyone in America can reach yeah. their full potential. But that's not what we've had so far. Uh, Mr. Dunham, though, uh, whether those questions will be handled in the debate is one thing, but on the other hand, uh, uh, in reality, do you think voters will really care? Will there, will there be anything that can be done before the election that would win voters' heart? Uh, on the other hand, uh, the, related to that, many suggest that the hardcore supporters of uh, uh, President Trump 
today in the White House are those who feel that they are being squeezed from below and they're being exploited from above. They have already have some very confirmed ideological uh, tendency of their own. So no matter what President Trump uh, does, um, as long as it's catering to their basic belief, it will be fine for the election and he will have the support that he needs. So uh, about that, how is it related to this racial justice issue as we have been just discussing? I think the issue of race is crucial in the election. I think it will be discussed in the debate. And I think how it is framed by the two candidates mm -hmm. is also crucial. With Donald Trump, he's using the terminology that Republicans have used since Richard Nixon of law and order, of riots, of restoring order. Uh, a lot of that was coded racism um, from the Nixon Southern strategy because that was their way of trying to get uh, racist Southerners to switch from the Democratic Party where they had been historically. Now, so I think for Donald Trump, it's a question of both overt racists and people who fear, as you were saying, who fear being squeezed from below and above. I think that Joe Biden still has a challenge. I think African American voters will determine the winner of this election by the turnout in places like the city of Milwaukee, in Wisconsin, in Detroit, in Michigan, in my hometown of Philadelphia, in Pennsylvania, uh, in in uh, in Florida, in the in the big cities of Florida. And what Donald, I mean, what what Joe Biden has to do is to have a racial justice agenda that connects with voters and makes them want to turn out in greater numbers than they did four years ago, African-American voters, uh, greater than they did for Hillary Clinton. Hillary Clinton got a high percentage, but she got a low turnout. Biden needs a high percentage and a high turnout in the African-American communities mm. of America. Is that the case, Ms. Curtis? Yes, um, I do think four years ago, there also were issues of voter suppression uh, purging of voter rolls, that was a part of it. But yes, he does need that enthusiasm for the turnout of African Americans, of some of the younger progressive people. Uh, and we do see his vice president, Kamala Harris, uh, also as a, a woman who is of South Asian and, uh, and black descent, that she is going out and speaking to some of these constituencies as well. Um, and it is a big contrast, so I think they will be asking it. Um, we have seen President Trump talk about that fear that your guests brought up, uh, that, that minorities will be coming to your suburbs. Um, he has thrown up Senator Cory Booker, who's an African-American senator, as, as sort of a fear factor. People will invade your neighborhoods. Uh, and it's kind of interesting about whether that will work because Suburbs now are much more integrated, and I don't know of too many people who wouldn't want Cory Booker as a neighbor, but um, I do think, yes, to answer your question, he is going to need the turnout of minority uh, voters. But it was black voters in many ways, particularly in South Carolina, that rescued his campaign in the primary. I might say one thing on, on South Carolina. I think there's an interesting race happening there. Jamie Harrison um, is... Yes. is challenging um, Lindsey Graham uh, in the United States Senate. Jamie was actually on Capitol Hill as a staffer the same time I was um, and went and led the Democratic Party in South Carolina. And you had Lindsey Graham on uh, Fox News last week begging for campaign donations. And if uh, Jamie Harrison were to win, um, you would have, for the first time ever, two African-American senators uh, from, from the state of South Carolina. Uh, but on top of that, black voters would be um, at the forefront of, of that movement to, to get him elected. And so um, we see up and down the ballot um, examples of black voters uh, and, and the issues important to black voters being central to a lot of the races happening. We've seen some voters already express their feelings that whether they vote or not is not going to make a dif dis uh, difference. We also see the Supreme Court justice pick by the Republican Party have been uh, in a way, providing a 
different thought to voters who whether want to vote for one or the other. We have also seen COVID-19 having an impact on the older population to come out. And of course, uh, voting on a Tuesday doesn't help with those who have a job uh, during the daytime. So eventually, some suggest it's quite close so far. So it's really about whether voters are coming out to vote. Mr. Fain. Well, voter turnout has always been an issue. I think uh, the greater the polarization of the nation, which clearly is probably at its high water mark, uh, the more incentive there is for both Republicans and Democrats to get their constituents out to vote. Um, I do think on that score, uh, it's more advantageous for the Democrats on the whole, which is why Republicans have launched a wholesale attack of trying to prevent uh, mail-in ballots, of trying to prevent uh, methods to make it easier uh, to get to the polls, to restore uh, some of the equipment and the time-saving devices in the post office. Uh, and those are all earmarks of a party that believes the more voters there are, mm -hmm. the less likely the Republicans will win. But surely you're correct. I believe that right now, if you just look at the registration figures, uh, if the Democrats can turn out their flock, they will defeat the Republicans. Mr. C Ms. Curtis? Yes, I would agree. It is a turnout election. They want to turn out the base. But as Mr. Fine has said, uh, we have the president who has thrown doubt on the validity of mail-in ballots, which we know we may not know if it's close, who wins on election day. And it seems like more Democrats, because of COVID and other issues, have signed up for mail-in ballots. Also, uh, the attacks, as he said, on the post office and the fact that they are going, we have 50 states, so we have 50 different election right. uh, mechanisms. So they are actually hiring many poll watchers to go uh, to the polls to check on people who are voting. Uh, they have lawsuits in many of the states. Uh, you see in Florida, which is a very crucial uh, battleground state, that a law gave former felons the right to vote. Uh, and now they have to pay fees and fines, and people have volunteered to pay them, and Republicans are fighting that uh, and trying to uh, throw some roadblocks there. Uh, and so uh, it seems that uh, I know in my uh, in North Carolina where I am, they've also uh, tried to throw some roadblocks with some uh -huh. of the voter ID. So yes, it's it's a turnout. Who can vote, but also whose votes are counted. The United States presidential election. CGTN brings context, perspective, and understanding. Watch CGTN. See the difference. Earlier, we have seen uh, certain statements coming from the uh, president sitting now in the office talking about he might not accept a result that he does not favor. Uh, but over the days, we have been hearing from um, Nancy Pelosi suggesting she's preparing for emergency possibilities. And we have also been hearing from uh, Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell suggesting uh, that the election results will count. So uh, we see and hearing different voices. How will that have an impact on the mentalities of voters, uh, particularly leading up uh, just a month to the election, Mr. Fain? Well, I think the most important element for unity is to keep our unbroken history of more than two centuries of peaceful transition of presidential power intact. It is most extraordinary. This is the first time in the history of the United States where a candidate for a major party running for president has cast a cloud over his willingness to accept the outcome of the election after all legal avenues of redress have been exhausted. Remember, this is the same president who has said, also unprecedented, that then I have Article Two, where I can do anything I want as president. The entire Republican National Convention was a crime scene of the White House committing violations of the Hatch Act, criminal violations, by employing federal government property and employees to advance a political agenda. Mm. This is the most lawless president by far okay. in the history of the United States. He's the last one who can talk about 
law and order. And we need to be unified around the fact that we have peaceful transitions of power. I, in fact, drafted a concurrent resolution for the House and the Senate, have sent it to Ms. Pelosi and Senator Mitch McConnell, mm -hmm. uh, which expresses the unanimous view of every member of Congress that the hallmark of the United States has been more than 200 years of peaceful transitions of presidential power. There's been no disagreement between Republicans or Democrats on that score. Uh, it is a standard that was set by our framers who risked that last full measure of devotion to give ourselves a republic. And the concurrent resolution expresses the unanimous view of the Senate and the House of Representatives that they will stand steadfast behind a peaceful transition mm -hmm. of presidential power after all the votes have been counted and legal avenues of redress. Okay. I think formalizing that sentiment and making it clear it crosses party lines is the best thing we can do to ensure we don't have the guns and the AK-47s decide what happens after November 3rd. Ms. Cardiff. Well, yes, I think it is important to have Republicans and Democrats vow that they will follow this peaceful transition of power, which distinguishes our country. Republicans have come out and supported it, but they have not criticized the president. Um, we also have seen the president allude to the fact that he has the bikers and the police and the military. But we've also seen members of the military uh, come out and say, listen, we, are, we serve the country and the Constitution, not a person. So we, we need our institutions to stand up for the Constitution. Uh, and so to guarantee on January 20th, a president will be inaugurated, mm -hmm. either Donald Trump or Joe Biden, and there won't be somebody else lingering in the White House. Mr. Dunham, you and I have been having conversations, whether when you were in Beijing or when you were in Washington right now. Uh, one of the things we talked about is about the wealth gap that has been existing in the United States, uh, certainly that has been exacerbated after the financial crisis 2008. We've seen a lot of movies and novels and uh, you know, documentary talking about the realities. Uh, tell me whether that will be uh, the issue or trying to, you know, have an impact on the overall uh, election result. Uh, will or will politicians take a great advantage of that issue uh, to bring out their political slogans? Will ultimate changes really happen with this election? It's a it's a really good question and an important topic. My guess is it will not the wealth gap will not play a role in this election. I think it did in 2016, particularly uh, with working class white men and their families who felt they were falling behind uh, because they're, you're right, since the uh, financial crisis, there's been a continuing uh, wealth gap and growing, and it's been growing through the Trump years. But I don't think that the people who are for Trump, who voted for Trump four years ago because they, they were upset about the wealth gap, are going to switch now. Uh, I mean, it, that's a good question, and Joe Biden certainly wants their votes. But I don't think it's, it's as important an issue now uh, as, as it was uh, in the past just because uh, it splits. It splits the two, par the, two, the two parties. And there are a lot of people who vote for Trump mm -hmm. who also feel that they suffer from the wealth gap, an anti-elitist vote. Interesting. Mr. I Andrew. disagree with that a little bit in the sense that I do think uh, when you see, say, the Reverend William Barber and his poor people camp campaign um, talk about many politicians talk about the middle class but they don't talk about the poor and the low wealth and we've seen with covid that that has really pushed more people into that category and they too are a voting bloc uh, and we've seen native americans uh, indigenous black and brown folks who really have been hit hard by that and they see this wealth gap i mean i was just seeing a report on in many native american communities the kids don't even have broadband to keep up with their studies. So this COVID has really exacerbated that particular piece of the wealth gap. And we see uh, William Barber, the Reverend and others really try to mobilize poor people to come out to vote. 
because they really don't vote as much usually. Mm -hmm. um, see so many people being evicted. Uh, this is really, uh, this COVID has really ch shown a light on that gap. The United States presidential election. CGTN brings context, perspective, and understanding. Watch CGTN. See the difference. Mr. Andrews, it is uh, widely known that uh, this president uh, in the office are very good at blaming the others from the very beginning of his term. Uh, for example, uh, blaming the international trade system, blaming World Health Organization, blaming China, blaming trade counterparts, blaming Canada, blaming the European counterparts, blaming, you know, the list goes on. Um, but, but, but at times, politically, sometimes it works. And we've seen the polls uh, seem to suggest that sometimes those uh, blames, once came out, uh, voters uh, tend to uh, have a more favorable impressions of this president. Uh, and by the way, it is a, a logic of politics sometimes that blaming the others would help to, fi uh, to solve the fire, political fire, at least at home. And this is not just in the United States, in other countries too. But Mr. Andrews, uh, will blaming be the right strategy this time for this election, particularly one month before election? Well, I think the primary uh, thing that President Trump would want to blame on uh, someone in the international space would be, uh, quite frankly, China and uh, coronavirus. However, uh, he, because of the administration's um, lax performance in terms of dealing with uh, the virus here in the United States, he doesn't want to talk about that um, as much as possible. I, I'm sure he'd much rather talk about his taxes than have to talk about uh, the coronavirus at this point. And so I think because of that, you won't see him play the blame game um, in particular on that issue as much as you might have seen uh, it happen otherwise. Um, will he make, perhaps from time to time bring up a trade issue? I know that there was there was a phase, there were some phase one goals with, with the new trade deal that, that and the, um, the import export goals weren't, weren't met. Could he, could he bring that up? Yes, but that's not really going to animate a large, uh, a broad swath of, um, of American voters. Um, it's certainly for folks in the farming community, it may push them, but, but their minds are probably already made up there. So playing the blame game, um, I don't think it's going to work here chiefly because of the subpar performance of the administration in dealing with uh, the, the, the coronavirus. Uh, and so, no, no, I, I don't see that happening as much this time. Um, he may, on the economy, um, say what he said uh, for now almost four years that he was able to bring the country back. Uh, he more, in terms of the economy, um, uh -huh. he more so kind of continued what President Obama had built in terms of the economy being strong and continuing to grow. So we may bring that up in, in, in blaming President Obama, but blaming international partners, I just don't see it being a win for him. Well, I would take maybe um, a more moderate view. I think Mr. Trump will blame uh, some of the economic doldrums on immigration, uh, that we're being overwhelmed by illegals taking jobs from Americans. Uh, there's no doubt that he will blame COVID-19 on China. Um, and it's not only just China in which he's engaged a trade war, but also with regard to our allies, uh, putting tariffs on for aluminum, steel, cars, etc., cetera, uh, claiming that we're taking, we're getting taken to the cleaners by foreign countries that subsidize their businesses and things of that sort. Uh, we did see in 2018 before the midterm elections that Trump talked about caravans of immigrants coming across the border uh, to take jobs. Uh, that didn't really work. The, the Democrats did win the House, but he does often pivot to, as uh, the other panelists have said, calling the, he's basically blamed the over 200,000 dead of COVID on China. And, uh, you know, he has blamed violence uh, on anarchists, and Black Lives Matter and other groups. So he does actually put names on people and things that he blames the American problems on because he also has said, 
I don't take responsibility for anything. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's sort of his uh, modus operandi. That's sort of the way he plays it. Finally, before we go, let's do a game. One team for Trump and one team for uh, Biden. What do you think, if you were the advisors of them, uh, what advice would you give before an, a, a, a first debate of a certainly really heated year? Um, I don't know how you would volunteer. Let's do it democratically. Um, so who would like to volunteer for an advisor of uh, Mr. Trump? No one? That's going to be Please. hard to get anyone to volunteer. Then I have to, <laughs> then I have have to, to enforce that. <laughs> uh, uh, Ms. Curtis and Mr. Dunham, and then uh, for Biden, uh, Mr. Fain and, uh, uh, and uh, Mr. Andrews. Uh, so please, just give some advice to these two candidates who are going to their first debate. Uh, Ms. Curtis. To keep the emphasis off of the most obvious problem that America is facing right now, which is COVID. Um, he has promised to have this vaccine, and he's trying to keep an upbeat note. But that's almost an issue he needs to avoid. That is, uh, and, and, and to try not to call people names, mm. because I think the American people right now, they are a little bit sick of the Trump reality show, and they would like a lot less drama and a lot more empathy. So I would say, I know you're not an empathetic person, but try to fake it. But I would never tell Donald Trump anything about empathy or sympathy. <laughs> He'd probably go off on me. So what would but, you say? But, but, but I, I would say focus on the economy, focus on, on real accomplishments and what you would do in a second term to make people's lives better. I would say uh, don't call, don't, don't get into name calling. And most of all, you know, stay on script. Don't go, don't go off on some tangent with some weird uh, statement that's going to be become the headline. Right. Stay focused. Stay focused. Uh, Mr. Fain, uh, for Mr. Biden. I would advise uh, Mr. Biden to say, listen, the most important thing we have as Americans is our unity behind process, that we debate things openly, that we decide things uh -huh. through voluntary voting, uh -huh. and that he accepts the outcome of the election, win or lose, but encourage everybody to get out, to vote, and participate. Ultimate sovereignty is in the American people. Okay. Uh, Mr. Andrews. I think for Mr. Biden, it's show the contrast between uh, the America that you want to bring, that you want to make a reality in 2021 and, and Trump's America. I think, too, it's you have to let the game come to you. There will be plenty of times for zingers, and, and, but, but um, pick one opening and hit it hard. Uh, and that will be, I think, the tagline, that'll be the news, that'll be the headline for the next day. Yeah. Um, Americans aren't expecting a whole lot of Joe Biden from this debate. Even though it is a game, I know you, all of you, put a lot of heart into what you have just said over the past uh, 45 minutes. It is an important election, certain for your country, and the rest of the world certainly will also be impacted as a result uh, comes out. Hopefully, soon. Thank you so much uh, for all of you. Mary Curtis, Bruce Fine, and Brandon Andrews, and Rick Dunham. All the best. Thank you so much. And that's our debate about the upcoming U.S. election and certainly the very first debate between the two candidates. That's all the time we have for today. If you'd like to see more, try to find us, World Inside the Name of a Program, or check out our YouTube channel. Follow us on Twitter and Facebook. I'm Tian Wei. On behalf of the team, thanks for watching. Bye for now.